Ezekiel 27, they're looking for Christmas. Christmas, I know that seems like, where are we going to find it? We found it last week, so I'm confident that we can find it again this week. Ezekiel chapter 27, we're in a series on uh, seven ways to poison Christmas, and the goal is uh, let's, uh, let's try to avoid these. <laughs> uh, let's, let's try not to do the same thing the nations did uh, before us. Let's try not to do the same things the world does out there today. Let's, let's, when we're preparing to come celebrate the birth of a Savior, let's, let's make sure that our lives are conformed in such a way that when we come to celebrate Christmas, we don't come as hypocrites. We don't come having lived our life poisoning Christmas day in and day out and then come to Christmas and pretend like everything's wonderful and God loves us. Let's work on it as we get closer and piece by piece. Now, here's the interesting thing. Ezekiel chapter 27, uh, we built this series probably more than a year ago. And this is how you know that uh, God works, even when you don't know what's going to happen a year from now or a year and a half from now or whatever. I didn't, I didn't build this series thinking to myself, let's talk about nationalism the Sunday after elections, last week. I didn't build this series a year plus ago and say, let's talk about materialism the week after Black Friday. I didn't put these things together. This series has been planned for a long time, and I didn't know that these would fall on these Sundays. But as I'm going through it, I'm thinking to myself, this is stupidly coinciding. I mean, like, you just can't, you can't plan these things. So I don't know if when you think of studying the book of Ezekiel during Christmas time, you think, Anthony, that's a stupid plan. I mean, you couldn't come up, come up with a dumber plan. Um, but I, I don't see that. Uh, I, I see a God who works through the scriptures, who lines us up with exactly what we need to hear, when we need to hear it, uh, and it's fascinating the way that he does it. So I say that to you because I want you to open your ears. If you're thinking, this is Christmas, we have no business studying the book of Ezekiel, uh, this couldn't possibly relate or couldn't possibly leave all that behind, because God is fascinating how he uses the scriptures to teach us exactly how we need when we need it no matter the chapter of scripture or what our preconceived notions of these things are. So stick with me as we go through this chapter. We're not going to get a bunch into the details of this passage. It's pretty clear. You'll be able to see it as we go. We don't need to explain a bunch of details as we go. Uh, and then you're looking for two things. You're looking for Christmas. Maybe you'll be better at it this week than you were last week instead of everybody looking at me like, yeah, Christmas, how are you going to make that one swing? And the second thing you're looking for as we go through this stuff is um, I want you to look for the direct rebuke of God. I want you to look for the direct condemnation of God. Look for something in the text that is like God is saying, know this. No, the answer is no to this. Uh, I want you to look for those two things as we go through here. Here's just a, 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 an overview so you get an idea of what we're looking at here. Chapter 27 in the book of Ezekiel is a lament. It's two laments, but it's one big lament, but two laments. A lament poem, uh, some of you, if you're poetic, you might know the, tome, uh, the term a dirge. It's a poem, it's a song. It's meant to be sung or recited at a poem, at a, at a poem, at a funeral, or a graveside, or a memorial service. In this case, the death of a nation. Lament over a nation. And if you haven't been with us, we're in Ezekiel chapter 27, and this is the section of chapters where God is talking about the destruction of the nations. Why? Why the destruction of the nations? Because in Genesis chapter 12, God said to Israel, those who bless you, I will bless, and those who curse you, I will curse. And so here's eight chapters of the judgment of God, just as he promised Israel that he would, because these nations were against Israel. These nations cursed Israel, and so God says, here's the judgment I'll give as a result because I will be faithful to them. Eight chapters. And we're in the middle of the judgment of a nation called Tyre, and there's two separate laments in this passage. The first one is from God through the prophet Ezekiel, lament over the destruction of the city. I don't know if you've caught on in this book yet, but God doesn't enjoy the destruction of the wicked. It's not what he's about. He will do it because he's just, but there's nothing enjoyable to him about destroying his own creation. He created us to enjoy us. We rebelled and his justice provides us punishment, but he doesn't take joy 
in this. So it's God's lament over Tyre. And then what you're going to see towards the end of the chapter is the people in Tyre are going to lament the destruction of their own city. So two laments in this chapter, and that's kind of how it goes. Look for Christmas. Look for the direct rebuke from God, the direct condemnation from God. See if you can find it in the passage. Verse 1, chapter 27. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, that's Ezekiel, saying, And you, son of man, take up a lamentation over Tyre, and say to Tyre, who dwells at the entrance of the sea, merchant of the peoples to many coastlands, thus says the Lord God. So there's your intro. And the following is going to be a metaphor. Imagine that. We're in the book of Ezekiel. It's a metaphor. The metaphor is a ship. He's going to describe the building of a ship and the materials for the building of a ship, and it's meant to describe the people, the nation of Tyre, the nation, the building, the people, uh, and everybody in it. So it's going to be all couched in a metaphor of a ship. Chapter 27, verse 3. Here's the construction of the ship. Thus says the Lord God, O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Remember that? I am perfect in beauty. That may be, in this passage, the only thing that you can hold against Tyre. But remember that. We'll come back to it at the end. Here's the description, verse 4. Your borders are in the heart of the seas. Literally, the ship, metaphor, the ship lives in the sea. Now, literally, as far as Tyre is concerned, we talked about this last week. Tyre, at the time of Ezekiel, was an island. So when it says, literally, your borders are in the seas, it's talking about an island. Your builders have perfected your beauty. They have made all your planks from fir trees. They have taken cedars from Lebanon to make a mast for you, oaks from Bashan. They have made your oars. With ivory, they have inlaid your deck from bo- of boxwood from the coastlands of Cyprus. Basically, you get four different descriptions of the most durable, the most useful, the best built wood you could possibly use to build a ship. In other words, the outside building material is the best for sitting in salty water. The oars are the best for rowing in salty water. And the mast and everything that's built in the deck is beautiful. It's the most beautiful wood you can find in the area. So basically, the description is you're built of the best things. Not just the best ecumenically as far as what is functional, but also the best of looks. Verse 7. Your sails were of fine embroidered linen from Egypt, so that it became your distinguishing mark. Your awning was blue and purple from the coastlands of Elisha. In other words, it wasn't just the wood that you were built out of, but your sails too. I mean, embroidered fine, they were beautiful colors. You weren't just this boring looking ship. I mean, you, you were beautiful, well-crafted, colorful. Verse eight, you also had the best working crew. The inhabitants of Sidon, and Arvad were your rowers. Your wise men, O Tyre, were aboard. They were your pilots. The elders of Gibal and her wise men were with you repairing your seams, and all the ships of the sea and their sailors were with you in order to deal in your merchandise. You didn't just have the best-looking ship. You didn't just have the best-looking castle or city. You didn't just live in the finest-looking thing. I mean, you were captained by royalty. You had the best of the best leadership, too. You had the most wise people, and whenever your stuff broke... You had the best craftsmen, too. So you didn't just look pretty. Everybody else kind of wanted what you had, and so they traded with you. Now, you can imagine, if you have the finest things, you're probably also going to need the finest army to protect that, which, God says, you also had. Verse 10, Persia and Lud and Put were in your army, your men of war. They hung shield and helmet in you. They set forth your splendor, the sons of Arvad in your army, were on your walls all around, and the Gamadim were in your towers. They hung their shields on your walls all around. They perfected your beauty. You, you had the finest army to protect your merchandise, to protect your city. Remember that I said last week, Nebuchadnezzar sieged the island of Tyre for 13 years and never broke down its walls, because they had a fine army. Now, Alexander the Great came and eventually did destroy them, but they had a fine army to protect all these things that they had. And now listen, as we keep going through this, is just one thing after the next, and what you're going to hear is the finest of this, and the finest of this, and the finest of this, from everywhere, the finest of things. Verse 12, Tarshish was your customer because of your abundance of all kinds of wealth, with silver, iron, tin, and lead, they paid for your wares. 
Any kind of metal you needed, you had the right kind of metal. You didn't just have one kind of metal that you were building everything out of. You had the right kind of stuff for the job. Verse 13, Javan and Tubal and Meshech, they were your traders. With the lives of men and the vessels of bronze, they paid you in your merchandise. So they gave you bronze, but they also gave you the best metal workers. You didn't just have a bunch of metal that you didn't know what to do with, standing there thinking, well, we got abundance of metal, but nobody just knows how to metal work. No, those cities that wanted to trade with you also traded you people who were the best metal workers. Verse 14, you also had the finest animals. Those from Beth to Garma were, gave horses and war horses and mules for your merchandise, for your wares. So you didn't just have a fine army with no ability to transport it. You had the finest animals in your finest army. And if you wanted to transport your, go your goods, you had the finest mules to do it. Verse 15, the sons of Dadan were your traders. Many coastlands were your markets. Ivory tusks and ebony they brought as your payment. You had the finest decor. You want decor from Africa, ivory, ebony? Oh, you can't find it anywhere else. You have it in your homes. Verse 16, Aram was your customer because of the abundance of your goods. They paid you they paid for your wares with emeralds and purple and embroidered work and fine linen and coral and rubies. You were adorned to the hilt. Clothing that you had that was beautiful and expensive, you had it. The jewelry that you wanted, rubies and diamonds and whatever else, you had it because you were beautiful, verse 17. Judah and the land of Israel, they were your traders. With the wheat of Mineth and the cakes and honey and oil and balms, they paid for your merchandise. You had the finest of foods. You prepared your food with the finest things. You didn't just look good on the outside. You ate well day in and day out. Verse 18, Damascus was your customer because of the abundance of your goods, because of the abundance of all kinds of wealth, because of the wine of Helbon with the white wool. You didn't just invite people to parties and offer them good food and make good food. I mean, you had the finest drink too. And the clothes that you had were made out of, they weren't just the finest looking clothes. They were made out of the best type of material. Verse 19. Vedon and Jovan paid for, their, paid for your wares from Uzal. Wrought iron and cassia and sweet cane were among their merchandise. And it just goes on and on and on. Verse 20. Dadan traded you with sackcloth for riding. Arabia and all the princes of Kedar, they were your customers for lambs and rams and goats. For these were your customers. You had the finest of animals to slaughter if you wanted to eat them or use them or sacrifice them. Verse 22. The traders of Sheba and Ra'amah, they traded with you and they paid for your wares with the best of all kinds of spices and the best of precious stones and gold. Haran and Kane and Aden and traders of Sheba and Ashur and Kilmah traded with you. I have no idea who any of those nations are, by the way. They traded with you in choice garments and clothes of blue, embroidered work and in carpets of many colors, tightly wound cords were among your merchandise. The ships of Tarshish were your carriers for your merchandise. You were filled and were very glorious in the heart of the seas. In other words, you had the best of everything. The finest foods, the finest clothing, the finest stuff. You had woods, you had metals, you had diamonds, you had rubies, every, everything, jewelry, everything you wanted, you had. Okay, some of you are reading those city names and you're like, okay, can't pronounce those and don't know what most of that stuff is. So what good is fir wood to me? It's what you build your houses out of. Let me put this in modern terms for us a little bit. Men, anybody in here got a Dolce Gabbana suit? No? Nobody in the last service either. Your Tom Ford dress shirt, it's like $800 dress shirt. You're wearing the Tom Ford dress shirt underneath your Dolce Gabbana suit. You got your Gucci socks or you got your R2-D2 socks. You got your L Alan Emmett suits. I always wanted a pair of these shoes, but they're like $400. I can't get myself to buy them. Handcrafted, leather. They're made in like Italy or something like that. You got to order them and they take forever to ship. They probably make them in America somewhere. You got your Rolex watch on. You're rolling up in your Maserati outside. And, and it's not just all looks and all on the outside. It, 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 it's on the inside too. They talked about wise men and the pilots and the sailors. And I mean, this is Tony Stark level intellect. You're walking around not just looking good on the outside like... Tony Stark, come on. Iron Man, I'm a good millennial. Billionaire, playboy, philanthropist, we can drop the middle one, but this is what he says. Women, you got your Oscar de la Renta dress on? Little Tiffany bracelet, earrings? Get your coat shoes on, Louis Vuitton purse? 
There's a Harry Winston something around your neck. I don't know how big it is. You go home, you and your husband, you go home, you got these purebred Great Danes that stand about this tall. And when they get up, they're like, oh. You, you eat at the finest places. You, you don't eat at Taco Bell, you eat at the finest places. And the reason I don't have any names for any of the finest places is because I don't eat there. <laughs> you wear the finest clothes. I mean, you, I, we t- I talked about some of the clothes that you might be wearing, but even when you're just lounging at home, you're like lounging at home in Lululemon or like Ralph Lauren or like you're not lounging in Fruit of the Loom, okay? <laughs> Your house is built like mansions, the, the best material, the finest furniture. When people walk into your home, you, got, you don't just have things built of wood, you have things built of hardwood, and not just hardwood, but like exotic hardwood. And people are looking at it going, man, how, how much did it cost to import that from who knows where, because that doesn't grow here? Decorations, gold, silver, iron, bronze. You got a lazy river in your backyard. You got a gym inside your house somewhere. The front yard's a soccer field. The backyard's a baseball field. And that gym that's inside your house converts to an ice rink in the summertime for your kids. I mean, like, you're, you don't just have the Maserati that you rolled up in. There's a Lamborghini in the garage, too. And, like, when you need to go somewhere that has more than two seats because you got kids, you just jump in the limo and somebody else drives you somewhere. It's basically what we're talking about here. And, 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 and you don't clean your house because there's somebody to do that for you. And you don't cook because there's somebody to do that for you. Landscaping outside, you don't take care of that because there's somebody to do that for you. And of course, all this stuff that you have that's beautiful, everybody else out there wants, and so you built a wall around your house, but you have the finest guards who carry very large weapons wandering around your house just being security so that if you need to go to war, you can. This is Ben Tyre's glorious history. This is the description of who they are. Now, this is Tyre's tragic present. Verse 26. Your rowers have brought you into great waters. The east wind has broken you in the heart of the seas. Your wealth, your wares, your merchandise, your sailors, your pilots, your repairers of seams, your dealers in merchandise, and all the men of war who are in you with all your company that is in your midst will fall into the heart of the seas on the day of your overthrow. At the sound of the cry of your pilots, the pasture lands will shake. All, the handle, all who handle the oar, the sailors, and all the pilots of the sea will come down from their ships. They will stand on the land. They will make their voice heard over you and will cry bitterly. They will cast, down, they will cast dust on their heads and they will wallow in ashes. Also, they will make themselves bald for you and gird themselves with sackcloth. They will weep for you in bitterness of soul with bitter mourning. Moreover, they will take up In their wailing, they will take up a lamentation over you. So this is the reality. Tyre, you had all this stuff, the finest stuff. I mean, it wasn't just stuff. I mean, you had the finest of the finest of the best from all the lands around you. But you made one mistake. You made one mistake, and that was this. You offended the Creator God by setting yourself up against Israel. See, when Israel was attacked by Babylon, you sat back and said, yes, well done. And although you had the finest of everything you could possibly think of, the one mistake you made was you set yourself up against God. Now the people of Tyre will give their lament when the city is destroyed, verse 32. A lament over you. Moreover, in their wailing, they will take up a lament over you. A lam- and lament over you. Here's what they'll say. Who is like Tyre? Like her who is silent in the midst of the seas. They're silent because they're destroyed. When your wares went out from the seas, you satisfied many people with the abundance of your wealth and your merchandise. You enriched the kings of the earth. Meaning the people that you traded with, they weren't necessarily destroyed as a result. I mean, you traded good things. You may have held a gun to their head to do it, like we talked about last week. But you traded them good things. Their kingdoms were better as a result. Verse 34, Now that you are broken by the seas in the depths of the waters, your merchandise and all your company have fallen into the midst of you. All the inhabitants of the coastlands are appalled at you. Their kings are horribly afraid. They are troubled in their countenance. We talked about that kind of last week. The merchants among the peoples hiss at you. You have become terrified or 
you have become a terror. The description last week is you who terrorize the nations around you. And now God is saying you are going to be the one who's going to be terrorized. And then the last phrase, you will cease to be forever. Here's the deal. The nation had the finest things. And they set themselves in opposition to God by cheering, applauding the destruction of Jerusalem. Bottom line, they chose the beauty of what they had right in front of them. And it was beautiful. It was glorious. It was wonderful. Instead of the beauty of serving God. Instead of the beauty of being faithful to him. They chose these things. Here's the bottom line for today. The finest things will never compare to the beauty of salvation in Jesus Christ. And you say, well, Anthony, they didn't know Jesus Christ. Yeah, but they had a choice. They had a choice to bless the people of God or to curse them. And they chose to curse them, set themselves up against the people of God. Did someone find in the passage the direct rebuke of God, the direct condemnation of God? Someone find... That in the passage, the direct like, this is bad, this is wrong. If you're thinking to yourself, well, no, actually, I didn't. I don't remember hearing it. You're listening well because it's not there. So here's the fascinating thing. There is no direct condemnation of the finest things in this text. So you want to go buy a Tesla? Go buy it. There, there's nothing inherently sinful about the finest things in the earth. That's the point. There's no direct rebuke. You shouldn't desire the finest things in life. In this passage, this passage describes you had everything. The problem is not that you had the finest things. The problem is that you trusted in the finest things instead of looking to God. So I'm, I'm not saying to you that you should just want to show up to church in rags and sell everything that you have and give it all away and never desire the fine things of the earth. It's not what it's saying here. The problem is not that you spent $80,000 on a Tesla. The problem is that if God asked you to give $50,000 to something else, that you're like, well, I've been, I've been saving for the Tesla, though. It's really shiny. I'm super close. The problem is not that you shop name brand things. The problem is that you shop name brand things because you think you're better than store brand things. The problem is not that God has given you good things. It's that you've forgotten that all good things come from God. The problem is not that we have overvalued Sometimes the finest things, the problem is that we've undervalued the cross. We've undervalued eternal life. We've undervalued salvation. The finest things are good. Some people out there, I know, based on the descriptions I gave, some people out there are like, look, I, don't, I must not have a problem with this because I don't have, I don't wear Gucci, I wear Hanes. Or R2-D2. I don't have a Tom Ford shirt. I, I, I wear whatever the store brand is. So I got this on a clearance rack. It was like $350. The, some of you are saying, I don't wear a Rolex. I wear a Timex. So I don't have a problem with materialism, right? Some of you are like, I don't have purebred dogs. I got the oops bread dog from the pound. <laughs> I was trying to think of the most gourmet thing in my house. The first thing I thought was the salmon that I have in my freezer. Here, but here's the deal. I had to fly to Alaska, catch it myself, harvest it, then ship it back on the plane with me. That's not necessarily just going out and being like, I'll take that fish right there. Why don't you prepare it for me? And I have to cook it myself. The next most fancy gourmet thing I could think of in my home was sp spiral mac and cheese. <laughs> the spirals, you know. <laughs> Some of you are like, I don't drive a Maserati, I drive a Ford. I don't have a limo. When I have to go out with the kids, I drive a minivan. And some people are like, I, I, I take the bus, so I must not have a problem with materialism. But it's, it's on a spectrum. Just because you don't have the finest of the finest of the finest things doesn't mean that you don't wrestle with materialism. 
For some of you, the Dolce Gabbana suit might be within your price range. And so if you're chasing after that, that might be that thing for you. This is a Joseph Abode jacket that I've had for about 10 years. Not the most expensive on the planet, but if you chase after it, it's the same problem. Doesn't matter the price tag on it. Materialism is on a spectrum. Here, here's another example. <laughs> we went Black Friday shopping, my wife and I, and we got some stuff at Kohl's. You get some stuff at Kohl's and they give you Kohl's cash. It's wonderful. So we're shopping and we're getting some stuff and they give my wife the Kohl's cash. My wife, literally, and this is no joke, turns to me, she looks me in the eye and she says, we are not getting stuck in the Kohl's cycle. Because, don't ask me how I know this, how this pattern works, but so you get Kohl's cash, I mean, you, you, it's like 15 bucks, and the thing is, if you spend 50 bucks, you get more Kohl's cash, so you go in, you spend your 15 bucks the week after, and you go in and you find, like, oh, that looks nice, and that looks nice, and that looks nice, and you take it to the checkout, you spend your $15, and they give you another $10 in Kohl's cash, and you're like, wow, this is amazing, and so you go back the next week, and they give you 10 more dollars in Kohl's cash, and you go back the next week, and by the time Christmas comes, you're $300 deep, but you spent your $50 in Kohl's cash, well done. <laughs> And so my wife turns to me and she says, we are not getting stuck in the coal cycle. <laughs> I said, don't ask me how I know these things. <laughs> Here's the problem. The, the problem is, is that some of us will spend hours searching, crafting, building a wish list because somebody who loves us said, what can I give you for Christmas? And you're like, oh, I got some ideas. And you'll spend hours looking through stuff and sending people to different places. Oh, I really want one of these, but it's on sale on Black Friday over there. Make sure you get it. And hours and hours and hours crafting these lists or this is what I would like or go here. Or, 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 and we can't spend 15 minutes reading our Bibles. Hours spent thinking about what material thing could possibly make me happy this Christmas. And we struggle to to read the book of Ezekiel because, I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about judgment and, like, I want to talk about Christmas and whatever's coming. Problem is that we'll spend, some of us will spend hundreds of dollars, some of us will spend thousands of dollars getting things for other people, saying, well, I'm, I'm getting gifts and I'm blessing other people and that's great. But somebody, some missionary comes and says, hey, we're doing a church plant in Guadalupe and you're like, mm. I'm going to have to pray about giving to that. Not sure. But I'll go out for Christmas and I'll blow the budget like that and I'll catch up next year because I got a credit card, so it's fine. But when somebody comes and starts talking about tithing or giving or supporting a missionary, it's like, mm, I'm going to think twice. I won't blow the budget on this. Bottom line is the finest things will never compare to the beauty of the gospel going out won't compare. Here's the irony. The finest things in life can be lost, broken, stolen in an instant. I had a pair of Oakley sunglasses that my father gave to me one time. He got them as a gift and he never wears them, so he gave them to me. And I said, I'm not losing these because I'm notorious for losing sunglasses. I have them, I put them down, and then they're gone. So I never buy expensive sunglasses because I know I'm going to put them down somewhere and they're going to be gone. But he gave me this pair as a gift one time, and I said, I'm not losing these. And they lasted a little bit longer <laughs> than all the rest of them. And then one day they were gone, lost, and I've never seen them again. Yeah, if you are wearing that Rolex watch and you rush by something and go, wham! How much is that Rolex watch worth now? It would cost you more to fix it than it would for the cost of all my watches. You just spill a whole bottle of lotion inside that Louis Vuitton bag. How fast can that purebred dog that you own chew up that handcrafted pair of shoes in your closet? I watched a video the other day of a guy driving down Hollywood Boulevard in his Lamborghini, and he's driving, and he's driving, and people are taking pictures like this as he's going by, and he stops at a red light, and people are like, shh, 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 
This guy gets puffed up. He gets a little arrogant. He's like, oh, this is nice. So he gets out of his Lamborghini, red light. He gets out of his Lamborghini. He's going to go pose next to his car. Jumps up on the hood, cracks the windshield. <laughs> and he's standing on top of his Lamborghini and his post like this. Cracking his windshield, standing on top of it. It's like, that didn't turn out how you wanted it, did it? Gone in an instant. That was probably $10,000 of damage. Because he was like, yeah, look at my nice thing. <laughs> The beauty of genuine faith in Jesus Christ is that it's eternal. You, you, you can't lose it in a war because Jesus already won the war. It can't be broken or lost because by definition, it is what restores us. It is what transforms us. It is what makes us new. You can't break it. It fixes us. You can't lose it. It can't be stolen from you. There's no human, there's no Satan, there's no demon who's powerful enough to steal you from the hand of God. It can't be taken from you in the night. There's no irony in the gospel. It's just the truth. Advent, the first week of Advent, as Philip mentioned in his prayer, is prophecy. Hundreds and hundreds of prophecies of Jesus Christ long before he ever lived. Here's one from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. We haven't gotten there yet, but we will. About Jesus, verse 24. My servant David will be king over them. They will have one shepherd. And they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. They will live in the land which I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived. And they will live on it, they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And my servant David will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in their midst forever. That's us, by the way. That's us with the Spirit of God dwelling inside of us, the sanctuary of God. My dwelling place will be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel, the true Israel, the ones who have faith. It's always been the way of salvation, Old Testament and New. When my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Christmas is coming. It's a celebration not of material things. It's not of fancy parties. It's not of high-end clothes or mansions or whatever it is shiny that you bought for Black Friday. And I did buy some shiny things. The finest things are not the enemy. They're not your enemy. God gives the finest things and bunches of money to lots of people who profess to believe in Jesus Christ. But it's what you choose to do with them. So let's don't choose to celebrate Christmas being focused on the stuff. As we prepare ourselves to celebrate Christmas, let's focus on the humble. Baby, born in a manger, if you want to poison Christmas, chase after the stuff that's on everybody else's wish list or crafting your wish list to make sure you get exactly what you want. You want to honor Christ, don't live for the material things, even the finest things. Pray with me. God, thanks that we can worship you day in and day out. God, keep us focused on the right things. Don't let us get distracted. Shift our focus, our mind away from hours and hours and hours spent thinking about how we could gain our status or have more stuff or have the finest things onto you who gives us eternal life whose sacrifice paid the debt that we can't. God, and as you teach us day in and day out to focus on you, would you help us to be a light to the people around us? To not live as hypocrites and then come on Christmas Day and say, yes, praise God for Jesus. God, teach us not to live for creation, but to create. God, we trust you. We're thankful for the scriptures. We're thankful that you would orchestrate our understanding of what it means to really be a follower of you, even through the book of Ezekiel. God, we praise you for transforming us in a way that we couldn't do ourselves. 
We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.